Hey everyone, welcome back to Q&A Thursday. Uh, it's been a couple of weeks and I'm in my office this morning, which is still a little bit of a disaster as you can see, so please excuse all the clutter behind me. But uh, you know, I, I share an office with my husband during the day, so normally I have to do the Q&A and most of my videos actually down in the kitchen. So he is off this week, which means he's down in the main area, so here I am in the office, which definitely isn't as pretty, but it's coming along slowly. So hopefully soon I'll have a little bit more of an interesting space behind me. In the meantime, ignore the clutter. Okay, so first question for today is from Jacopo. And Jacopo, and I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, he asks, what is the average lifespan of a low content book? I've seen many low content publishers needing to continually upload new books, otherwise their income sinks to almost zero. If you stop publishing new content today, would you earn at least 50% of what you're earning today a year from now? So this is a really good question and this is where the quality over quantity principle comes in. Now, if you're pumping out low quality books at full volume, what that means is that when you're publishing these books, you might get one or two sales, but because the quality isn't that great and they just don't stand up to the competition, once you get those one or two sales, that's basically all you're going to get. So once those one or two sales have been made, and in some cases, no sales at all, um, that book is just going to die a very quick death. And in order to keep up the pace, you're going to have to keep pumping out tons and tons of books just to get those couple of sales each. So it's kind of a never ending process. If on the other hand, you publish a high quality book, what you're going to find is that the opposite will happen. You'll make a few sales that will move you up in the bestsellers rank that will give you more visibility, which means you'll make some more sales which means you'll get a better bestsellers rank, which means you'll gain more visibility. So it starts to have this snowball effect. And that is what I really saw in 2018. So at the end of 2017, I had a baby. So I wasn't gonna be doing anything for a while. And for those first six months, I actually did absolutely nothing. And even in the second six months, I, I'm not even sure if I published 50 or 100 books in all of 2018. Um, but that was my best year ever because everything that I had done in the year before had just continued to pick up steam. So that was great. Uh, you know, I had books that were just steadily climbing. Now, if you look at my income report, what you'll see is it climbs steadily for the first half of the year and then it starts to falter at the second half. And that is because many of my books are planners. That's where I've had a lot of success. Um, so the planners are obviously seasonal and by the end of that year no one's buying 2018 planners anymore. So that's when you see my sales really start to take a dip. Now if you remove the planners from the equ equation, all you've, all you've got left are my guest books and some of the children's books that I've got, um, different journals and stuff like that. When you remove the planners out of the equation, you still see a, a steady incline from beginning to end of the year. But as I said, with the planners being seasonal, what you're actually seeing is, is more of a, a climb and then a drop off. So if you're publishing a lot of seasonal stuff, like I do, a lot of my stuff is planners. So those are all dated. Um, you are going to, you know, you're going to have to keep creating current versions of those throughout the year and as each year comes to a close. If you're focusing a lot more on the perennial um, perennial books that don't need to be updated, if you're putting out good quality things and getting sales, you should actually see the opposite happening. So I like to do both. I like to have a core group of perennial books that will just continue to make me sales throughout the year because then you're not going to go through the intense peaks and valleys that I've experienced. But having said that, I also don't want to miss out on some of those big seasonal spikes because those have added tens of thousands of dollars to my overall bottom line. So, you know, I'm, I'm willing to see a little bit more of this, but for a lot of people, they don't, 
maybe have that luxury and, and really need to focus on creating that core group that's going to be consistent from month to month. So um, I think I wavered a little bit off topic there, but I think you get the point. If you're focusing on quality books that aren't attached to a season, you shouldn't have to keep pumping them out at volume to maintain your sales. Uh, you sh it should have the opposite effect. Okay, so second question. By the way, if you haven't seen that income report, I'll link to it down below and you can take a look. Okay, so this is from James and James asks, in one video you did an incognito search and came up with 50,000 keyword results. You said that you consider that saturated. What would be considered a good keyword result that you might explore? So there's not really a black or white answer here. Everyone has a different threshold of what they're comfortable with and what they can you know, feel like they can compete against. Personally, for me, I like to see a few hundred results. That's the best case scenario, but you know, to be honest, that is gonna be quite difficult. Usually it's between one or 2,000, and I've gone up as high as 5,000 before. But if, if I'm gonna go up to about 5,000, I wanna make sure that A, I either have some sort of a unique angle or I can offer a higher quality than what I'm already seeing. And I also want to make sure that I've got a few lower competition keywords and I could add into the mix. If I've got my keyword and I'm seeing more than 5,000 and all the other keywords that I plan to use with that particular idea all show at least 5,000 or higher results, then I'm not going to pursue that keyword. It's just too competitive. But if one or two of my keywords are competitive, they've got at least 5,000 results or more, but I've also got a few other related keywords attached to that main idea that I'm going for that are, are less competitive, then I'll probably still uh, keep that keyword as part of the mix. So it's gonna be different for everyone. You wanna really experiment, but those are the loose parameters that I use. And like I said, it's more than just results. Um, that I take into consideration. And I think there's another question further on down the line that I, I can expand a little bit more about that, but that's definitely one of the considerations and that's the general parameter that I use. Okay, so another question from James, another two questions from James actually. Um, okay, in another video, the word metadata was used. While I have a general understanding of the term, I wonder where this type of info would be used in low content publishing and what that might look like. So strictly within the context of self-publishing on the KDP platform, all that metadata is, is the information that you're going to enter during the publishing process about your book. So it's your title, your subtitle, series title, author name, description, keywords, all of that stuff. That is your metadata. And that is what KDP is going to use and crawl through to find keywords to give your book visibility in the Amazon store. So what you really want to do is pepper in as many keywords as you can throughout all of your metadata. So you can include keywords in your title, subtitle, series title, description, keyword slots, obviously. The main thing is you really have to make it sound natural. You don't want to be keyword stuffing in your title or subtitle field. Amazon doesn't allow that. So you want to use them where possible, but it has to be natural sound sounding and it can't be stuffed. Um, obviously your keyword slots, you're going to put your keywords in there make sure they're in your description. Again, used naturally in sentences, not just like listed off in there. Um, and that is basically, you know, the best way to make use of that metadata. Okay. And next question, I've used HTML in creating web pages in the past but I'm a little confused by where you would input this. Is this placed in the regular description field and Amazon converts it when displayed on their site? So yeah, you're just gonna enter the HTML right into the description field in the KDP uh, background when you're uh, inputting all of your data before publishing your book. And if you're unfamiliar to HTML, you should check out Keith Wheeler's page. Um, he has got a couple of really excellent videos on his channel about how to create great book descriptions using HTML. Um, they're really, really good. One of them is just all about 
how to create a book description that sells, formatting with HTML. And then the second video goes into a bit more detail on specific formatting uh, tricks that you can use with HTML. He talks about how to swap out your bullet points uh, using different types of symbols and stuff. So definitely check that out. Um, I'll link to that to those videos below. He's also got lots of other really great stuff on his channel. So check out all of his videos, highly recommend. And he also mentions a couple of free tools. And one of them is through self-publishing with Dave. And if you haven't checked out his channel, do. He's got tons of great, great content there. And also Dave Chesson. They both have um, HTML description generator. So basically you just type out your description, format it how you want, and then it will spit out the HTML code, which you can then just copy and paste directly into your description. So it's a nice little time saver, really handy tool. So check all of those resources out, which I'll link to below. Okay, next question is from Linda. And Linda asks, I uploaded a 200 page line journal with my price at $6.99 for a 94 cent royalty. When I tried to select expanded distribution, it said my minimum price had to be $8.13. Should I try to make my price higher, book shorter, or forget about ex expanded distribution? So you could actually experiment with any one of those three options. Um, it's all about experimentation. So I always encourage that. If your book, if you think it remains at a competitive price at the higher price, then I would say try that out. Um, if you think it's just putting your book at too high of a price and you're no longer going to have any sort of competitive edge or you don't think you'll be able to command that price, then I would just forego the expanded distribution and that is often what I do. I find that expanded distribution makes up such a small portion of my overall sales that it's not really going to be useful for me to keep the expanded distribution if I have to raise my price point uh, to a point that I think it might turn customers off. Um, if it's not too much of a difference, I would probably try it. If it's just if it's knocking me up like an extra couple of bucks, then I would just I just forego the expanded distribution. Um, and then your third option there, which is you know you're talking about a 200 page line journal, it, you could try just cutting out 50 pages, making it 150 and um, seeing what the price difference is there. And you might want to try that out. So, you know, with, with any of these, you can just try one. And if you're not happy with the results, try something different. So, you know, as I've said, it's all about experimentation. You got to keep trying things until something works. So don't be afraid to try something. And then if it doesn't work, try something else. All right. So next question from Nami. How do you analyze niches that are worth pursuing or testing out? So I use the same techniques that I've outlined in my how to validate a book idea video and my keyword research tips video. So that's the manual method, which I do use in combination with a paid tool. So for the last few years, I've been using Merchant Words, which I've been really happy with, but I've since switched over to Publisher Rocket which um, which I also really like. So I'm using Publisher Rocket now. And what that tool and then what any of these paid tools will do is they're basically just going to provide the research method that I've outlined in my manual how to videos. It's going to do that in a matter of seconds rather than a couple of hours. So really what, what it's going to do is it going to is it's going to dramatically reduce the amount of time it takes for you to do your keyword research. So it's not necessary in the beginning, especially if you don't want to start forking out money for a couple of different programs. But once you get to a point where you've made a little bit of money and you're ready to start reinvesting back into your business, then I really recommend one of these tools, um, especially Publisher Rocket. It's just going to save you a lot of time and uh, very easy to use. In fact, next week I'm going to have a little bit of a tutorial on how to use Publisher Rocket. So I'll kind of take you behind the scenes and, and you can see uh, Publisher Rocket in action. So basically when I'm using this tool and combining it with my manual research methods, I do kind of go back and forth a little bit. What I'm looking for is a monthly search volume of over a thousand. If it's under a thousand, it just doesn't feel like it's going to be very profitable. So again, everyone's got a different threshold. Yours might be lower, might, might be higher, 
For me, I like to have at least a thousand. That's kind of my lowest, that's my cutoff point. If it's below a thousand, I don't bother. For search results, I like to have, like I said previously, maybe up to 2,000. Hundreds is better. I will go up to 2,000 and I have gone as high as 5,000. If, like I said previously, I've got a few other keywords in the mix that are lower competition, or I really feel like I've got a fresh and unique angle on whatever that keyword is, then I might still go for it. But generally speaking, I don't really go much above that, if at all. I'm also making sure that the competitors don't have a ton of five-star reviews. So I want to make sure that I actually have a shot. If, you know, most of the books on the first page have 10 or 20, 50, 100, four or five star reviews. I'm just not gonna be able to compete with that with a new book starting off at, with scratch. So um, then I, I won't bother. If it's just a couple that have a few reviews, that's fine. I'm not really threatened by that. But if there are multiple books on the page using that keyword with many, many four and five star reviews, I just don't bother. And then the final thing is, can I create a higher quality book than what already exists? In many cases, I do feel confident that I can if they're all super high quality and they've got great reviews, then I just feel like my time is not um, worth investing in that particular niche, so I'll move on. But those are the main things I'm looking for when I'm analyzing a niche. And it isn't a science, it's definitely a bit more of an art. You're kind of working on hunches sometimes and that's okay. Uh, there's not a strict formula. So, you know, I really would encourage you not to be looking for that exact formula. Those are my thresholds and my parameters. Feel free to try them out and experiment with them. Um, and you, you're probably gonna come up with your own system, but that's, that's what I do. Okay, Tanvir asks, how should one write the seven boxes of keywords in phrases or single words? If I use a phrase, then there is a risk of a repeated keyword. So I use longer tail keywords. Um, I would never recommend using just a single keyword in a keyword slot. It's just going to be too broad. When you get a keyword phrase, that allows you to get more specific and really narrow things down. So definitely use a phrase if you possible, and then make sure that each one is different. So don't repeat the same parts of keywords in the different slots. Make sure they're all seven different keywords if you can. and. If you're putting a keyword in the title, keyword in the subtitle, make sure you're not repeating those in your keyword slots either. So just try and keep them as different as possible and using the longer tail keywords is going to be more helpful for you because it allows you to get more specific, narrowing things down and becoming less competitive rather than one word that's gonna be a lot more broad. Okay, so Jacopo has a couple more questions. So, all right, could you make a list of all the software and websites that you use, including stock image websites? So this is really easy. Um, basically, I get all of my images from deposit photos. If I'm looking for a photograph and I can't find it when I'm looking for on deposit photos, then I head over to Unsplash, which is a fantastic resource. It's got really professional quality stock photography that is free and you do not have to attribute it. Attribution is encouraged, but it's not required. So that's a great resource. Um, if you can, I do encourage you to use paid stock photography. It just takes out the hassle of having to attribute images and then you've just got that paid license. Uh, one of the reasons I use deposit photos is because every year, I think it's AppSumo, they do a deal with, and it's 40 bucks and you get 100 credits, so basically 100 images. So it's a really, really good deal. I've been doing that every year for the past few years. So that's where I get all of my images. In terms of software, when I'm doing any vector editing, I use Adobe Illustrator. Photo editing, I use Adobe Photoshop. And to put all of it together, I use Adobe InDesign. And if I'm doing any sort of manipulation with PDFs afterward, I'm doing that in Adobe Acrobat. So that's what I use. There are lots of different options out there. A um, couple of free ones. Um, 
a couple of less expensive paid ones. Certainly don't have to get the Adobe Creative Suite like I've got. I've just been using that for, oh, like, oh my God, 20 years. Wow, okay, I've been using that for almost 20 years now. So I'm, I'm just like deeply entrenched in the Adobe environment. That's why I continue to use it. But you can check out um, Affinity Designer. Uh, I've been checking that out. That is a lot less expensive than the Adobe Creative Suite. And it looks really, really great. Um, I'm hoping to try and get my hands on a copy so I can do a couple tutorials for you guys. That I believe is a one-time payment of maybe like $60 or something, I think. Don't quote me on that. But that's much less expensive than the Adobe Suite, which is, I think it's about $70 per month US. So that's a lot more expensive. Um, moved to the subscription model a couple of years ago. So Affinity Designer is a great one to check out if you don't want to be paying, uh, you know, almost 100 US bucks a month. And Scribus, Scribus, Scribus. I know a few of you use that. I believe that's free. That's another one I'm going to look into doing some tutorials for you guys because I think, uh, especially those of you who want to get your hands on something either, you know, less expensive or free, that could probably be... Uh, good. So uh, I'll do some experimentation there. Um, okay, so a couple more here. Where do you find inspiration on how to build an interior design that is coherent and interesting to the target niche? So there's not really any big secret here. Um, basically, I just use Google, I'll look at Pinterest boards sometimes, but I want to just try and hang out where my target audience is hanging out and just see what they're interested in and most of that is just I'm looking online. Um, if I'm out somewhere like Chapters or Indigo, I'll always head over to the section where they're selling the different journals and stuff like that and I'll just take a look at what's selling, what's trending currently and I, I just try and take inspiration from all of those things. Um, that's kind of it. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll look for that target audience online, see if they have any websites that they frequent or groups and just kind of take a look at stuff that already exists in that sphere and, and just get my inspiration, see if there's any way I can improve on it. And that is really about it. So no big secrets that, for that one. Okay, last question. What do you think about hiring someone on Fiverr to design interiors if we have no experience at all with graphic design? Is it better to learn ourselves and put out naive beginner designs or to invest money on something professional looking that we can then use as a template for 20 or more books? Really good question. So if you feel creative and you think that creating these books is something that you're really going to enjoy and you don't mind putting some time and effort into learning, maybe learning some software and you know, you're, you're willing to put in the time and accept that it's probably gonna be a slower build then I would say go for it, design it yourself. If, on the other hand, you do not consider yourself creative at all, don't feel like you would enjoy creating these, and don't want to waste time learning some software and putting in that effort on that side of things, then I would definitely suggest outsourcing it to a designer that can do it for you. They will enjoy doing it. If you're trying to create, you can't be creative if you're not enjoying it. If you attempt to make some book covers and interiors and you're just sitting there thinking, I'm not creative, I hate this, you're not going to create anything of quality. There's no way you're going to be creatively inspired. You're not going to create anything good. So all that time and effort and frustration is going to lead nowhere. It just won't be worth it. So if this is you know something where you just kind of want to get in on the business model, but the creative aspect of it isn't for you, then outsourcing is a real uh, path for you and you should definitely do that. Find a designer whose work looks good and outsource that portion of the business to someone else and that's just going to take that load off of your plate and things are going to go by a lot quicker and you can focus on the research part of it um, and the scaling and, and you know the strategy part of it and you can have someone else doing, um, doing the creative stuff. And 
you know, I design all of my own stuff, but I, I'm currently using um, some hired help from Upwork to help me update all of my planner interiors because I just don't have time to, to do some of that stuff anymore. So even though I'm still working on the design of the covers, I've got all my planner interiors that I need to update for 2020. I've got someone else doing that for me now because it's just gonna take too much of my time. So figure out where your time is best spent and if you've got a bit of cash flow that will allow you to spend more time on that and take a couple of the less desirable tasks off your plate, then I would definitely recommend doing that because it's just gonna move you forward faster and remove some of the frustration and get you out of that hell of doing things that you don't wanna be doing anyways and you're not good at anyways either. So that is my suggestion there. All right, so that is it for Q&A Thursday for today. Thanks guys and Sorry if it's been a little bit noisy. I'm kind of right by a road here and I've got all the clutter and I realize that I've been shaking my desk. So hopefully no one's getting motion sick sickness from the camera moving back and forth. So I'll try and keep a better eye on that next time too. All right, it's almost the weekend. So have a great weekend and I will see you Monday with another video. Take care guys.